A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will look after and tend my sheep. As a shepherd tends his flock, when he finds himself among his scattered sheep, so will I tend my sheep. I will rescue them from every place where they are scattered, when it was cloudy and dark. I myself will pasture my sheep. I myself will give them rest, says the Lord God. The lost I will seek out, the strayed I will bring back, the injured I will bind up, the sick I will heal. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy, shepherding them rightly. As for you, my sheep, says the Lord God, I will judge between one sheep and another, between rams and goats. Verum Domini. reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through man, 
the resurrection of the dead came also through man. For just as in Adam all die, so too in Christ shall all be brought to life, but each one in proper order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. When everything is subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. Verbum Domini. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will reply to them and re will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison, and not minister to your needs. He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. 
Verbum Domini. Lasti Christe. Today we have the great solemnity of Christ, the King of the universe, <clears throat> the King of everything. And in the first reading today, we have a prophecy of Ezekiel to a, a captive people. In 597 uh, BC, the Babylonians invaded Israel and led away the, the top echelon of society, the leading citizens, they led them into captivity. 587, they came back uh, again and destroyed the temple and had a, another deportation of the population. And the Israelites were in captivity until 538 BC when the Persians conquered the Babylonians and released the Israelites. They were free to go home. And they did. They went and rebuilt the temple, which was only a shadow of its former glory. It was later rebuilt shortly before the coming of Christ. And the kings in the line of David there during that captivity were cut off. So the people, <clears throat> you know, the last king in the line of David died in captivity. <clears throat> the people were in a very desperate place. They were very hurting. I actually went and Googled, used Google Maps to see how far it is from Jerusalem to Babylon. It's over 800 miles. And there's a desert you know, in between, and not, not like a desert probably with swirls and things like that, but like sand dune desert, you know, with absolute uh, nothing. They weren't coming back on their own strength, right? They were completely exiled. And so Ezekiel prophesies to this captive people that God has not forgotten them, that he himself will become their shepherd. He will lead them back. He says, I myself will look after and tend my sheep. I myself will pasture my sheep, will give them rest. Earlier in Ezekiel, he's prophesying you know, to live the covenant, not to sin. And that was the reason they were exiled, right? Because they disobeyed God. And now he switches in this section to this, this call of mercy uh, you know, exhorting them that God will be merciful to him, to them. And he tells them, the lost I will seek out, the strayed I will bring back, the injured I will bind up, the sick I will heal. It's a beautiful poetic expression of the heart of God for us, that he has a heart for the weak, the lost, and the injured, which is us, right? He pulls, draws close to us. He'll seek us out, he'll bring us back, he'll bind us up, he'll heal us. Jesus is in the line of David. He is the Messiah King. He fulfills the kingship of the Old Testament. He, you know, Mary is told at the Annunciation that the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom will there, there will be no end. So he is reestablishing this kingdom of David and bringing it to this new fulfillment, this new fullness. And the Israelites experienced restoration, right? They were brought back to Israel. And Jesus is rescuing us from a deeper captivity, a deeper bondage of sin and death. That 800 mile journey, that desert is an image of how we can't restore ourselves, right? We can't liberate ourselves. We need to be rescued. We need to be given new life. So he establishes a new kingdom. He establishes his lordship over us. He's giving us new life. How does he do this? Well, we hear in the second reading from 1 Corinthians <clears throat> that it is through his paschal mystery that Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of this new life that he's going to give to us. That as death came through man, Adam in the Garden of Eden fell, resurrection also comes through a man. Later in verse 47, we didn't read it today, but it says the first man 
was from the earth, a man of dust, the second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, and as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. That he's ushering in this new redeemed humanity, right? Because he is from above, he's giving us a life from above where we are from the line of Adam, we've inherited death, right? We've inherited original sin. And Jesus from heaven is giving us that heavenly life. So the last Adam, Paul tells us, became a life-giving spirit. Through his paschal mystery, suffering, death, resurrection, ascension, he sends the Holy Spirit upon us that communion with his body in the church, we receive this spirit. His body has become a life-giving spirit. So in Christ, Paul tells us, all shall be brought to life. He is the goal, the focus of everything. If we want to live, if we want to be rescued, if we want to be restored, if we want to be brought back, it's going to happen in and through Christ. And Paul speaks of the proper order of this transformation. What is to happen? That first, Christ is the first fruits, right? He is the one who rises from the dead. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. This is speaking of the, the second coming, where we experience the resurrection of our bodies. And then, after, you know, after that second coming and the general resurrection, then comes the end, the end of time, the end of the world. So that's, that's the plan. And he says, this marvelous phrase I love, he says, when he, when he hand, at, this, at this second coming, when he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, where he'll destroy every sovereignty, where he reigns over all his enemies, where death is destroyed, where everything is subjected to him. So this kingdom he established through his paschal mystery, through from the throne of his cross, that's begun, right? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, he tells us in the gospel. It's going to be handed over to the Father, and all things will be made subject to him. Death itself will be destroyed. You know, some of us act like we are going to be quietly ushered out of a movie theater or something at the end of time. You know, where someone silently signals to us, okay, it's over, come on, let's get out of here. Or we're at a talk or a presentation, you don't want to interrupt what's going on, what life's really about. The fullness of everything is found in him. That all things, Paul tells us, are reestablished in him. He is the goal of everything. The fullness, the meaning of everything is found in him. And he is going to hand over his kingdom to his father, established from his throne on the cross. Something great has begun and is underway. Not just some personal relationship with Jesus, but the goal and destiny is in Christ, right? Everything is, is leading towards him, is yearning, aching for a fulfillment in him. And this kingdom is very much underway. It's present here in mystery, yet it's growing. It's gradually revealed in salvation history. We see this kingdom, we're told in the gospel today, in the marginalized, right? Those who are pushed to the side, those who are, are suffering, those who are stripped of the great things of this world, who are stripped of the fullness of this world, they are especially eloquent witnesses of the Lordship of Jesus. Right? Those who are hurting in whatever way, physical poverty or some spiritual poverty that they're suffering, they are clinging to Jesus, right? Because they've been beat up in this world and this world isn't it for them, right? They cling to Jesus and in them, we see Jesus in an eloquent way. And he tells us, you know, it's repeated in the gospel here to, to make the point. He says, I was hungry, right, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. A stranger, you welcomed me. Naked, you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, you visited me. He's saying he is identified with the poor, the marginalized. And Jesus is the kingdom, right, in person. So if he is there in a special way, his kingdom is there 
in an eloquent and special way. So this kingdom is underway and we serve it, we further it, we spread it when we serve the least. That's our, our marching orders he gives us today. So we're not quietly called out of that theater, right, in a, in a secret way, but we're called by our life of faith to be even more involved in this world, right? It sends us, we're all missionaries, right? The Pope just repeated that recently, that we're, we're sent into this world to bring about this kingdom, to, uh, to foster gospel values that prepares for its coming, right? That makes way for the kingdom. We're gonna hear that theme uh, in the coming Sundays of Advent. The church is sent to proclaim, serve, and witness to this kingdom. Vatican II said that she serves as a leaven and as a kind of soul for human society as it is to be renewed in Christ and transformed into God's family. The church communicates divine life and reflects the light of this divine life and shows forth the dignity of the human person. Right? She's to be a witness uh, to this plan of God, to this kingdom. She shows forth the new family that's formed in Christ, a family that's formed uh, through faith, through charity and its works, and through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And everyone, right, the church witnesses to this call that's issued to everyone. Everyone is called to belong to this kingdom. She proclaims the kingdom and repudiates the bondage of sin. Repudiates the bondage of sin. Right, that we, you know, we live in an age where we're, we're held by sin and we don't even realize it. Right, if we look at the, the modern sexual revolution and see how, I was recently reading again by our Holy Father, how, how this has particularly hurts the poor and the young the most, right? They are especially vulnerable, vulnerable to, the, to the ravages of the modern sexual revolution. You know, statistically, we know that single motherhood has reduced many young women to poverty, that children growing up without fathers, it's devastating to their development, to girls and boys, that the promiscuous lifestyle wounds young men and women and presents greater challenges for them to live a happy married life later on. We know that by statistics. That's not just church teaching, that's statistical data. That abortion takes human life and leaves a wound in the parents, right? That they suffer from that act. And that a self-centered lifestyle, which is at the heart of the sexual revolution, which is at the heart of a, a radical feminism, strikes at the heart of family life or any kind of human community. This is the way of the world that is presented to us today as some kind of liberation. And we're sitting here wandering around in a desert, starving to death, right? And trying to find a, a better way. Well, the church is called to proclaim a new kingdom, a new way that leads to life, that makes the way for the coming of Christ's kingdom. Vatican II and its document on the church and the modern world speaks of this mission of the church. And it says, while helping the world and receiving many benefits from it, the church has a single intention, that God's kingdom may come and that the salvation of the whole human race may come to pass. For God's word by whom all things were made was himself made flesh so that as perfect man, he might save all men and sum up all things in himself. The Lord is the goal of human history, the focal point of the longings of history and of civilization, the center of the human race, the joy of every heart and the answer to all its yearnings. He it is whom the Father raised from the dead, lifted on high and stationed at his right hand, making him judge of the living and the dead. Enlivened and united in his spirit, we journey toward the consummation of human history, one which fully accords with the counsel of God's love, 
to, to reestablish all things in Christ, both those in heavens and those on the earth.